So episode 48, uh, what seems to be an incredibly popular topic, uh, much like osteoarthritis was, not that we're just talking about rheumatoid arthritis, but rheumatology is, is the, this evening's topic, or this morning's in Australia, and we're delighted and, and hugely appreciative of, of Professor Debbie Turner for, for joining us, who, uh, if I get this correct, is at Western Sydney University, I think I've got that correct, I hope I have, That's and nice. is, is good, thank goodness, <laughs> and is... Um, outrageously experienced in the field of, of rheumatology both in the UK here and then and then since relocating uh, huge amount of publications in in the area um, not just papers but a book as well so we just can't wait to pick pick your brains on this on this topic that's so huge and fascinating and um, the questions that we got in beforehand I had three different people ask a similar question so I thought we'd just kick off with that one if that's okay and it's probably one you it's pro probably one that you get a lot I would guess mm -hmm. and um, given that, that clearly it's come from people that aren't members of a rheumatology team uh, and the question as such is uh, what what sort of is the role of podiatry or of a podiatrist in a rheumatology team so Who's in? What does that team consist of, and what's your role within the team, and what are the sort of uh, the, the issues that you're seeing? Okay, I think um, I think probably we we can look at answering this question in, in two different ways, um, because I think that. Um, when you're in a rheumatology team, and um, because there are a spectrum of different disorders that you will be um, looking after. Um, there is an incredible skills mix which is actually needed to look after these patients and what you will find is that um, the skills mix will be very much dependent on sometimes the case mix of the, of the centre. Um, so for example, um, I was fortunate to, look, uh, to, to work in Leeds as a clinical specialist and because of the expertise of the rheumatology team there, we actually had a really high case mix of patients with connective tissue disorders. When I um, was working up in Glasgow, um, whilst they did see patients with connective tissue disorders, the expertise of the team was very much around spondylarthropathies. So I think um, it's, it's a really difficult, there isn't a predefined team um, in terms of and roles and respective really hard line roles in terms of this is what a podiatrist does, this is what the physio does. And I think it, it's very much dependent on um, the infrastructure within the team that you're working and then what uh, extended scope skills you may have developed. So um, in Glasgow, um, I worked as a podiatrist. We worked within a rheumatology outpatient setting. As part of our core team, we had a clinical nurse specialist and the clinical nurse specialist did more of the drug monitoring. Um, and, you know, in reality, they, the patients wouldn't see the rheumatologist very often. And it really was um, a connection between the clinical nurse specialist, the extended scope physiotherapist um, and um, other members of the team, podiatry, um, OT, um, social work, sometimes input from the psychologist as well. So I, th I think your role within that team will be defined one in terms of the environment in which you're working and then also the skills mix that you have if you have skills in diagnostic ultrasound and injection therapy that would be a major part of of what you would do within the team if that's not your skills mix then probably your role would be slightly different with perhaps more of an emphasis on the mechanical therapies um, I think in terms of um, the, the people that are within the team, um, it, it is so um, widespread are the manifestations of rheumatic disorders that it can include a whole host of people. Often it will be funding dependent as terms of who are the key players within that team and probably what the expertise of the academic centre is and what their research interests are. Perfect. Great answer. Um, you touched on sort of the, the, you know, the rheumatological conditions that, mm -hmm. that you may expect to see in a team. And obviously it's going to vary, but what are the sort of, uh, if there is such a thing, what are the, the big five? What are the, the common ones? If someone's thinking about getting into this specialism or students want to really bone up and think about a career pathway, where, where should they direct their reading? Where, where, would, be good, where would be time well spent on certain pathologies? 
I think probably um, the best way to, to answer that is to think about when I was um, more working as a clinical specialist within a service, um, what my week looked like. I was really fortunate in the fact that when I was at Leeds, um, I worked really closely with Heidi Siddle. There wasn't much of a podiatry rheumatology service at that time. And um, a lot of our focus was dependent on RA. Um, and um, general treatment, callus debridement, um, and mechanical based therapies. And we worked really closely with the orthotists because what we soon um, recognized um, is that very often barriers to orthotics were dependent on accommodation of quite complex foot deformities within footwear. What we hope now is with the advent of treat to target, the recognition of the window of opportunity to treat, the view is that really as podiatrists we shouldn't be seeing these really complex foot deformities that we used to see 10-15 years ago. Um, so that was a major part of our, our time but what we actually then found was that um, a big proportion of our time um, we were spending actually trying to um, uh, get rheumatologists in to see patients that we were concerned about when they developed a foot ulcer. And because of the complexities, because we needed the, the um, rheumatologists to come in with a view to, because we weren't independent prescribers, to determine if antibiotics were warranted, then also there's the complex because of the pharmacokinetics combined with the spectrum of other medications that they might be on. Um, and what we then decided to do was to actually try and see all our ulcerated patients at one point. And we started off and we had our uh, clinic that worked, uh, that was basically one morning every other week. And such was the demand that it, it eventually ended up going to a day a week. Um, and what we actually found was that um, uh, there was no clear signposting. I think if you have a patient with diabetes and they develop a foot ulcer, it's really clear that they go into a high risk diabetic foot service. Whereas what we actually found with our patients with rheumatic disorders is they were actually going all over the place. Some were being managed by dermatology, some by the vascular team, some by district nurses, some by clinical nurse specialists. And once we actually had that kind of signpost service, and then patients started to come in there. So from the high risk perspective, um, it was patients with connective tissue disorders, um, patients with scleroderma where calcinosis had broken down. Um, we had a lot of patients with gout and ulcerated tophi. Um, we had patients with vasculitic episodes, um, so um, hopefully trying to facilitate autoamputation um, if they've had a major vas vasospastic episode, and then ulceration on high pressure areas with patients with rheumatoid arthritis that might be uh, have had long-term steroid use or that were on biologics. Um, so th there's that whole kind of spectrum really um, in terms of the mechanical-based therapy um, moving on to, to, to the high risk. So I think the great area around rheumatology is that it, is, it encompasses everything. Um, in the fact that you have, um, you've got to be good at your general medicine, you've got to have a really good understanding of the impact of the medications. Often these patients have complex comorbidities. Um, and um, it, it's quite interesting. I was at, um, I was at a, a kind of a high risk foot symposium um, for diabetes. And there was a lot of talk around how people were getting really good results from thinking about the nutritional load of patients and vitamin C, screening people for vitamin C deficiencies and then incorporating in. And they're now starting to use inventories um, to, to look at, you know, how at risk they might be. But that's the kind of thing in rheumatology you would be doing, generally recognising that very often these patients would have anemia, they would have inflammatory bowel disease, they would be malnourished, that their zinc levels would be low. So I think it, it's um, when you're trying to say what would you focus on in study, I think um, look at the diseases and get a good understanding of the typical manifestations and then start to think how that will influence um, lower limb mechanics, lower limb tissue viability. Um, a lot of these patients are at high risk of vascular disease. Um, you know, very often we need to consider the vascular risk in someone with rheumatoid is probably about equivalent to someone with diabetes. But I think in the podiatry circle, people don't have that perception. Yeah, very much. I mean, it's clear. It's you don't do a you know you 
you don't do a master's in rheumatology and, be and become a master at it. It's pretty obvious. You, mm. if, if someone did want to post grad and, you know, almost, you know, someone see your career trajectory and thinks, yeah, I, I, I like the idea of that for my career. What would your advice be on where to study? Because clearly they could probably do a biomechanics based mm. master's and that would tee them up quite nicely. They could probably do a wound care or, or you know, uh, tissue viability masters. And that's going to be a lovely set. They could even go from the, the podiatric surgery MSC, which is very, you know, medically based as well. I mean, well, there's no real obvious route to me. You can you can you can go from anywhere. Is that a reasonable comment? I think it is from a um, from a, a formal training route. Um, mm. However, I think that um, probably it would be getting within the rheumatology networks. Um, probably, you know, most um, people that are working within services like that, that if someone were to um, contact them and say, could we come and shadow um, for a couple of days and just see the type of of work that you're doing um, we would often have people coming up and looking at um, the service in Leeds and um, for example with a view because they were interested in trying to set up their own service um, in respective areas and um, <clears throat> I think also that the rheumatology professional groups um, and um, for example um, for, for those of um, for, for those watching that are in Australia there is the rheumatology health professions association um, that has now um, just actually changed and it's, it's now come as a special interest group under the Australian Rheumatology Association. Um, and um, we're convening a, a conference in Sydney in 2020. Speaking to the, um, and I'm part of the steering committee, so hopefully we'll be able to get lots of, of, of great profiling for podiatry within that conference. Um, however, speaking to um, the RHPA, um, their current membership, and bearing in mind this is podiatry, physio, and nursing in Australia, their current active membership is 50. Five zero. Five zero. I, I <laughs> was wow. amazed. Um, wow. So, you know, uh, I, I think that really it's, it's around people becoming active participants in those groups because the, the you know as and when there's a critical mass within a group like that then you'll start to see that there will be um you know practice-based education events and and i take on board you know very often people would say i've done a master's in, in rheumatology however it was very generic um because a lot of universities to have a, a, a financially viable master's program will have to be opening it up to all, all manner of professionals, which is still great. Um, however, you will often find that people come away from those saying, well, I'm not entirely sure. It's not given me that practice skill set that is actually going to change my practice when I go in into back into work next week. Yeah. So I yeah. think it's around contacting people and finding out where local services are um, and probably I would say in rheumatology informal networking has probably been where I've gained most of my skills not through formal recognized mm. training programs yeah interesting Knock it, so knocking on some doors basically which is which is fine Ian Riley's just posted a comment actually I think it's a quote from someone called Zeer and the quote is there is there is no other medical specialty that interfaces so closely with podiatry as rheumatology um is that that might be a famous quote it's from a u.s uh, a u.s textbook i think i um, I, I completely agree and i have yeah. got to say i think that um uh working with rheumatologists um you know they're a delight to to kind of work with and they're often so respectful of the role that other professions um, can make. And, and certainly, um, I think one of the quandaries for rheumatologists is, is this inflammatory or is this mechanical? And they, they come asking that question. You know, this person, and what we've got to remember is a lot of the disease outcome measures exclude the joints of the feet. So DAS-28 is a, is a common outcome tool where rheumatologists will use that to assess localised disease activity and whether they need to escalate um, or change medications. But what you'll often find is that patients might come into a low disease state or even a remission, but they'll be telling their rheumatologist, I have really quite disabling foot pain. And um, the rheumatologist then in a quandary in terms of, well, um, I'm really happy with what's going on elsewhere in the body, 
what do I do about this? And is it simply mechanical? In reality, I think that it's probably often a combination of the two. Um, and that's where often it's a combination of mechanical based therapies. And then, I mean, uh, there is nothing that's changed my practice more than being able to incorporate ultrasound scanning into patient assessment. You can be precise as to what structures are affected and then you can target them. Um, you know, with, um, you know, targeted intralesional or intraarticular joint injections um, and, and really kind of improve um, patients' status. Perfect. There's actually a question about ultrasound coming up later from someone who clearly uh, has done some Googling of you, I think. Um, <laughs> can we quickly uh, divert the, the questioning into... Uh, the podiatrists, of, w of, of which I'm very much pointing the finger at myself on this one, who work within the MSK world and have probably been guilty of, of, of having our blinkers on and missing, missing rheumatological conditions, what we refer to as the musculoskeletal masqueraders. So we see people who, just because they're young and healthy and sporty, mm. they present to us with joint pain or tendon pain, and we go straight down one, one avenue. And I'm, I've forced myself over recent times to, to get much better at not thinking that way. But um, there's various different kind of tips out there for people to sort of not fall foul of this screenings and questions to ask in the history taking. Could you give us your top tips for, for the likes of me not, not missing potentially uh, non-mechanical problems? I think the first... Um, positive step is to actually start to consider that you need to consider it and then exclude it. <laughs> yeah. that, that's the first thing that what you actually need to do is to have as part of your standard questioning certain key questions that might then um, for you to think yeah I'm confident that we really don't need to explore that anymore or actually I perhaps need to look at this a little bit more. Um, I think probably the classic one <clears throat> would be um, around the spondylarthropathies. And this is where you would typically have your sporty um, male um, that, um, you know, would present with Achilles tendon, resistant Achilles tendon problems or, um, you know, a plantar fascia problem. And um, I think there are a couple of key things around um, asking if there is any positive family history of any arthritis. Um, I think um, asking around um, things like if they have any eye involvement, um, if they have, what's their skin like? Um, do they have, you know, kind of a dry scalp pore? So you'd, you'd want to be looking towards the, the, the positive family history. Um, what we do know is that people that are HLB, HLAB27 positive, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are HLOB27 positive that will never develop any spondyl arthropathies. But again, like RA, there's this genetic susceptibility combined with an environmental trigger. Um, the environmental trigger will often be some type of an infection. So as part of that kind of history taking, we need to be thinking around, um, you know, around the reactive arthritis. Um, now, the reactive arthritis is this sudden onset um, you know, often a monoarthritis, and it commonly presents more often with a kind of a, a an inflamed knee. Um, but it can occur in the in the kind of ankle, and it, you know, you can have the classic enthesitis. I think other things um, would be looking for evidence of dactylitis. Um, so asking around whether they've had any isolated digits that have become swollen, um, whether there's any nail involvement. Um, and asking around gluteal pain. And I think that those kind of, if, uh, probably one of the, the best things for people to have a look at is um, the um, classification criteria um, for spondyl arthropathies. So there's the AMOR criteria or the ESSG, and I can, I can provide details so they can go onto the Facebook feed afterwards. But they're really nice in the fact that there's some standard questions that you can ask in clinical practice and um, you can start to get a score and, um, you know, dependent on which one you're using, it will give you an idea as to whether you really do need to be considering that spondyl arthropathy. What you do tend to find is that the reactive arthritis very often will be associated with a sexually transmitted disease. And very often that's what patients don't want to disclose to you. <laughs> so, you know, just often terminology like, have you had any infections? Um, this might even be three months ago, might be a tummy infection, might be a waterwork infection or 
something similar um, can often kind of give the indicators that you you know kind of without out blunt you know because um, people can not really understand if you're asking about a sexually transmitted disease when they've come in with plantar fasciitis. <laughs> a challenging uh, a challenging thing so like most things uh, we've had several talks from uh, several episodes with several people and it all sort of comes back to the same thing whether it was the dermatology episode or this one it's, it's in the history isn't it the, absolutely those 10-15 those minutes before you, they've even taken their shoes and socks off they're not on the plinth yet they're not on the treadmill we yeah. really should have a bit of a feel for what's going on by the time those 15 minutes are up sure. and the other thing in terms of just um, whether you're suspicious then of um, an inflammatory arthropathy that's not a spondyl arthropathy um, there was a, a really nice campaign in the UK the S factor um, which um, was um, uh, you know kind of uh, targeted around the time of the um, X factor which was around that if you have um, swelling um, in three or more joints and it's been persistent for the kind of six weeks then really you need to be starting to consider um, you know with a MCP squeeze test or a lateral MTP squeeze test that if you have those present that you really do need to be um, considering the possibility of an inflammatory joint disease. Mm -hmm. So Perfect. I think operation of those as part of just standard practice should start to, to kind of um, pick a lot of people up. Yeah. So the take home message here for anyone in, in a non rheumatological setting is to, to make those what would be considered rheumatological history taking questions part of your your standard Standard. history yeah there's just no room yeah i think the other thing to say is um when i've spoken to a lot of rheumatologists they would always prefer to see a patient and exclude the possibility than miss Mm. them early because um what we do know is is that the earlier you get patients and if you treat them quite aggressively um they have better outcomes The one thing to say is that often you will find that rheumatology services, um, you know, will have, could have considerable waiting lists. For example, at Liverpool Hospital here, which is one of our um, closest hospitals, um, for a rheumatology standard appointment, they're waiting this about 12 months. Um, However, um, if there's a suspicion of an inflammatory joint disease, because they got a, a lot of kind of referrals around back pain and where there really isn't that quality in the referral in terms of suggestion of inflammatory joint disease so the one thing that they um, are really quite key on is that they will triage and see patients sooner if it's really clear that there is a suspicion of an inflammatory joint disease so I think the other thing that we need to do when we're kind of referring back to a GP saying I think Uh, you know there might be a suspicion of we've got to be really good at signposting exactly why we think that that's the case you know positive lateral squeeze test swelling in four mtp joints which has been persistent beyond six weeks and those types of things um, are really important in terms of that quality of information going back yeah in in the private in the private sector and um, there's a few sports doctors in london so they work with professional sports teams sports physicians which is obviously a, a specialism specialism in its own right now but they a lot of them come from rheumatology consultant rheumatologists that then move into sport and they just seem to be the, the really really great ones to send uh, one of them i work with closely just says to me you know you take a pretty good history if something just doesn't feel right to you you know mechanical things are often very very obvious and if something just doesn't feel right if something in the history taking doesn't sit right yeah. just send them to me and obviously we're very spoiled privately that that i can see someone on a monday and they can be in with him by the wednesday and then he can run a full a full yeah. workup so uh, yeah. we're, we're pretty spoiled in that regard is your experience that the the worlds of sport and rheumatology uh, is i mean there's clear overlap there but do I mean, rheumatologists move into sport. Have you ever known sports people move the other way into rheumatology? Um, Probably less so, but I I can see just in terms of um, uh, the the wide approach that would be needed, how there would be really good synergy across. I think Mm. that um, generally my experience has been that I've been looking at, um, at people where 
we're not talking about that they're not able to undertake sporting activities. The patients I'm used to looking after are actually struggling with just maintaining activities of daily living. So we're kind of being operating at different ends of the spectrum. I, I <laughs> but what we hope is that um, with um, the fundamental changes in the paradigms in which these patients with inflammatory joint diseases are treated, that we should be aspiring to our patients with um, ankylosing spondylitis undertaking sports. Um, yeah. So I think what we what we don't understand enough around, and it, it's really frustrating when you look for evidence base to try and incorporate within your practice. When it comes to things like management of the Achilles tendon or management of plantar fasciitis, every single study that will look at a non-pharmacological intervention excludes patients with inflammatory joint diseases. So we actually know very, very little from an evidence-based point of view um, in terms of what we should be doing from a management perspective. Actually, Debbie, just, interesting, just a comment in a, coming out of that question about the early referral and diagnosis. I know when I first graduated, the, back then, the typical management of rheumatoid arthritis was it probably wasn't even treated initially. Mm. Um, maybe a bit of aspirin after a while. Oh, it's not working too well. Let's, let's try an anti-inflammatory. Mm. And then 10 years later, they might have been given gold. Yeah. Yeah. The biologics are being thrown at them aggressively from day one. What's going to happen to the, these foot deformities? Are they going to go start de declining? Well, in in theory, that's that's <laughs> what you would expect. I mean, um, I think um, unless you're in America, biologics are not targeted um, early. You would still have um, that most patients would need to um, uh, be eligible for a biologic in both Australia and the UK and would need to fail two DMARDs. What you tend to find is that rheumatologists, even if they haven't um, put the, the, the kind of label on the patient yet, i.e. we think it's RA or we think it's psoriatic arthritis. What they will tend to do is, even if they're classing it at that stage as an undifferentiated inflammatory arthritis, what they would then look to do is, is start them on a DMARD. Um, very often, and again, it, it varies dependent on the centre, and very often they will start them on a combination of DMARDs, um, typical ones are methotrexate and sulfasalazine. Sometimes there'll be triple therapy of, of methotrexate, sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine. What they will do is then very, very carefully assess response um, using you know, recognized response criteria mm -hmm. and then use that as a basis to either escalate or change. So what you find, the dependent on the center and just what their regime is, most will now have early arthritis clinics. And what you will often find is that patients are now being considered for biologics and um, probably sometimes six, nine months um, after that initial kind of consult. Mm -hmm. So they're getting onto the biologics very, very quickly. I think conversely, the difficulty, Craig, what I would say is we're still not picking up the diagnosis early enough. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that. Um, so very often, unfortunately, I still have patients where they, the common um, phrase will be, I was diagnosed in 2016, but I actually think I've had it since 2006. Um, and these are the people that have been boomeranged to the GP with, you know, this kind of more episodic a flare, remission, flare, remission, and it never really gets picked up. And unfortunately, as part of that process, the patients actually start to feel quite demoralized. Um, and, you know, eventually when they get the diagnosis, it's like, thank goodness, it's not all in my head because they start to almost feel that, you know, that nothing is wrong with them and it is all in their head. Yeah. So I had an interesting conversation with an orthopedic surgeon it was well over 20 years ago, um, if not longer, and he was telling me he did a follow-up on his Morton's neuroma surgeries that he had done 20 years previously. And he said uh, over two-thirds of them now had rheumatoid arthritis. Wow. And, the, but this and was that, a, Yeah, this was a 20-year yeah. follow-up on his surgeries, but yeah. he never published that or anything, and it's always stuck no. in my mind, you know. And that's interesting because that probably ties in, if, you, if you're familiar with Kathy Bowen's work, where she looked at um, patients um, with rheumatoid arthritis and found a really high proportion of them had either intermetatarsal or submetatarsal yeah. bursa, yeah. Um, then, then, yeah, you can kind of see how that perhaps might translate. Yeah, but that might have been a 20-year history before the actual you know, a neuroma 20 years later diagnosis of the RA. That's, that's a long, slow, you know, 
But although what you kind of need to consider is very often people would diagnose a, a neuroma based on kind of a splaying of the digits. Sign of at the NTP joints or an intermittent yeah. parcel bursa would give you a splaying of the digits. Yeah. So it might be they had rheumatoid arthritis, it just wasn't picked up. Yeah. <coughs> oh, but it'd be kind of interesting to see how the long term outcomes can be affected if it is picked up as early as that. And, and you know, the, these severe foot deformities that we see so much now, just whether they will start declining and and I think the simple fact is we, we just don't know. Um, I think um, it's quite interesting what we do know from, from um, some you know, kind of uh, studies that are coming out now is that certainly BMUD imaging features are delayed beyond clinical. So people clinically will get better. You scan them and they still look to have synovial hypertrophy effusions within their joints. Um, some work by Andy Brown where they followed patients up that had evidence of subclinical disease on ultrasound but were classed as being in clinical um, remission or low disease states actually were found to develop more erosions over time. So I think that, that the one thing that I always kind of consider is am I actually looking at still active disease or to what extent can joint capsules actually recover following a massive inflammatory response and you know um, what we're just doing some um, work at the moment and um, we'll be hopefully getting that out to be published soon but what we certainly know is that our patients with inflammatory joint diseases their forefoot splays much more um, during dynamic tasks um, oh, and their age. And so I think one of the things we've got to consider is once you've had that massive inflammatory response, you've had the joint capsules that have been stretched, it'll impact on the collateral ligaments. The, I, I'm just not sure of the ability of those structures to actually recover after such, uh, you know, a, a, an inflammatory episode. So we might actually find that um, whilst their pain may improve i suspect that we will still see um development of deformities yeah sure let me let me just share my screen there's just a i, I presume you saw that study from last week on subclinical synovitis but th th this conclusion comment really really stuck with me ultrasound detected subclinical foot and ankle synovitis considerably affected patients functional status and quality of life however yeah. it is often unnoticed by physicians which is ex yeah, exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ab absolutely. So I think it's around, um, and this is what we, this, some of our early observations um, uh, of, of patients, they have synovitis at the MTP joints. They fundamentally change their walking style. They become apropulsive um, because they don't want to load sore forefoot. Um, the inflammation subsides, but they continue to walk in the same way, which probably explains why our patients with rheumatoid arthritis have higher prevalence of venous disease and venous ulceration. Um, we simply still, I don't think, understand anywhere near as much as we should how to go about um, treating these patients effectively. Yeah, sure. Actually, I know, Ian, you had a question on ultrasound, but maybe just, uh, just a question on ultrasound now, Debbie. So you using ultrasound routinely clinically in these people? Yeah, so we use it point of care. Um, uh, so in the, in, the, in the kind of clinical work that I'm still doing, we, we have a complex rheumatology um, clinic. So yeah, um, as part of what we do as part of our, um, we tend to see what, we, what are referred in as complex patients. But as part of our standard would be ultrasound imaging for two purposes. One, to get an idea of quality and quantity of soft tissues, whether joints are eroded or not, because we use that to inform our decisions around orthotic prescription. Um, you know, but what also it's around identification of disease in the foot that otherwise wouldn't be detected because the rheumatologists are not looking for it. Yeah. That makes sense. What was the question you had on ultrasound, Ian? The it was... It was incredibly similar to the one you've just oh, okay. asked, actually, <laughs> which and it was ultimately um, with respect to imaging, um, where, where to, uh, to, to use these actually, what, what is the most appropriate sort of hierarchy of imaging? You know, if someone comes in and you decide, right, is it, is it X-ray, ultrasound, MRI? You know, you have these sort of uh, yeah. suspected sort of 
pathways for certain you know, fractures or tendinopathies. And the question was, if you suspect something rheumatological. Um, so I kind of think, I think it probably overlaps with what you've just answered. That's point, point yeah. ultrasound point of care, isn't it? I think as, um, a, as a general rule, I was really fortunate to spend some time with um, Peter Bealant, who um, is a, a really well recognised um, rheumatologist who has, has trained in um, ultrasound and, and, and teaches on a lot of the ULAR courses. And um, I always remember Peter saying to me, if the patient is quite specific, in pointing to a key kind of really quite localized area on the foot ultrasound is great if it's a bit more of a general kind of looking around then really it, it's other imaging I think the one thing that we've got to recognize is whilst um, um, x-rays can be useful what we've got to recognize is that they're not useful in early disease um, so we need somewhere between about a 30 to 50 percent loss of bone mineral density for an erosion to be detected on x-ray um, and it's, it, it's been amazing for me. Sometimes we've scanned patients and seen these huge erosions on ultrasound and they're simply not visible on x-ray. Um, so, yeah, ultrasound is, is really quite useful for assessing um, disease activity. You get really nice resolution of the tendons. It's really good um, for getting an impression of um, the alignment of the sesamoids. Um, you know, I think the great utility of ultrasound is that you can use it and dynamically see if tendons are bunching. Um, increasingly, um, I'm looking at the movement of um, the Kegas fat pad in and out of the um, uh, retrocarcaneal bursa and how smoothly that's gliding getting an impression of whether there's mechanical, you know, bony irregularity over a tendon and that mechanical load. So whilst I'll use it for quantification of disease activity, I think as podiatrists, we can use it in really quite different ways with a view to gives you an idea of how, how responsive someone might be or not conversely. Mm. Yeah, yeah, superb. I've just had a question uh, horribly Huge apologies if this feels like a bit of a detour from the, uh, the, the sort of path we were taking, but it's just come in from someone who uh, are, who I trained with actually, and they've prom made me promise I'm going to ask you this. Um, and they said, and I sort of remember this myself as well. We we trained 18 years ago. We recall, or they recall, and they've just reminded me that we were told that gout most commonly affects the first metatarsophalangeal joint, not that it you know, it can affect other areas, of course, but because of that was, that joint is the coldest. And uh, is that, is there, is there, is that some sort of a, a myth? Is that steeped in fact? Where are we at? Why is the first MTPJ the most commonly affected joint for, for gouty attacks? I mean, so certainly I have heard the same in terms of that, um, that um, cold um, will tend to make the uric acid uh, crystals deposit out more and that's why you tend to this 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 was my understanding as well which is why you will tend to get two or five deposits that will deposit on the um you know kind of the, the ear the pillar of the ear um around the the kind of nose and again if you look at um, my clinical experience often is that two or five will deposit kind of um predominantly kind of first and fifth um, and again, that's probably where you've got the, the contact of the foot, um, you know, on the outside part of the shoe. And, and yeah, I'm sure that, Craig, you'd probably be able to tell us about um, recognised temperature distributions within footwear, wouldn't you? No, I mean, I've heard the temperature one. I've heard the pH difference yeah. one argument. I've heard the argument that it's the joint that has more trauma than other joints. So, you know, we've got lots of potential reasons as to why it could be more common in that joint and it could be yeah. any one of them or all of them or you know um, uh, so we're not sure yeah absolutely but i mean whilst um gout often does commonly present in in the first ntp joint um commonly i tend to see that the classic bootstrap presentation involvement at the ankle and obviously kind of the, the knee as well um so i um one of the things that we were talking about before we came online um, was around you know how you might be able to, to make kind of clinical decisions and there was a really nice um, paper um, that was presented um, I'm just kind of um, so validation of the diagnostic rule for gout without joint fluid analysis because everyone will know that really the gold standard is um, aspiration and looking for crystals I don't know how many of um, how many people have kind of worked in those centers a lot of the time I have 
been in centres in Glasgow, we would routinely be taking aspirin out. We had a polarising um, red light microscope and we, we did go on the hunt for crystals. But invariably, you would often find that you... Um, you would see crystals and it would be really quite obvious on ultrasound and just that point of aspirate didn't have crystals in it. In reality, most people won't have that facility in their practice. Um, whereas um, they, this nice um, study um, around we should always be thinking about septic until proven otherwise. And um, what they looked at was um, this algorithm where um, looking through some various risks as to whether they've had a previous attack, the typical pattern of onset, whether the joint's um, red or not, um, first MTP joint involvement, and if you have um, the presence of hypertension or cardiovascular disease, and if you have access to their um, levels of their um, serum um, acid, uric acid levels, then what you can do is you can come up with a score as to whether there's a high suspicion of gout, um, a low suspicion of gout, and conversely, if there's low suspicion of gout, it then becomes a high suspicion of septic arthritis, and if it's intermediate, um, then it should be septic until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. so I'll make sure that we, we get the, the details of that paper shared because I think that that's something that can be really helpful um, with clinicians because the one thing that you don't want to, to kind of miss is um, a septic arthritis. But certain things like we know that our patients with rheumatoid are more susceptible to a septic arthritis, those on biologics, those with total knee replacements, total joint replacements are, are more susceptible, and the elderly. So um, I think, you know, those papers are really helpful, I think, in clinical practice, because those are areas of risk for litigation. Yeah, yeah my, my recollection on that red hot joint, if it was septic, I can't remember if it was 24 or 48 hours, is the only window you've got to prevent joint damage. Um, yeah, that's obviously why it's so important. Absolutely. It's one that you don't want to, to, to miss. So, yeah, very much always having the mantra, yeah, okay, it, it probably could be gout, but I probably need within my notes, mm. I've gone through that, that kind of um, mm. process by which I've convinced myself that it is indeed gout. Um, just because someone's had gout in the past doesn't mean that you couldn't be looking at a septic arthritis. Sure, yeah. Perfect. So it seems in the rheumatology world, there's a lot of quite quite sensible approach to say this could be a couple of things let's 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 assume it might be the worst of those until proven otherwise and let you know so let's not assume this is a tendinopathy or you know let's assume it's it's rheumatological let's not assume it's gout let's assume it's septic arthritis and then the algorithms to sort of work through i think it'd be you mentioned it a couple of times it'd be awesome if we could list some of those things in the comments for for people you know watching who will be seeing msk issues yeah. and gout yeah. or hopefully hopefully they're msk issues and gout but the backup plan being you know here are the things to consider to, yeah. to rule out the the more sinister that would be really yeah. really cool yeah. i've got one last question on my list are we okay for time craig yep yep no perfect yep. and it, it's just a it's a bit of a big one really it's just cool. about uh, foot orthoses in rheumatology and obviously you you've touched on sort of the the bringing in of orthotists and special footwear particularly when you you visualize or you you google the classic rheumatological foot and you think of this horrifically shaped thing and uh, just give us a sort of 2018 uh, summary if such a thing is possible of, of of sort of the role of foot orthoses now i know you've done a lot of research in this area and and, and sort of um, your thought processes and, and your practices when prescribing them okay um i i think probably if you'd have asked me this question before i came to australia it would probably my answer might be a little bit different i think um coming to australia working within a different healthcare environment um, where, um, you know, I don't think I realised just how fortunate I was in the UK being part of that, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, integrated multidisciplinary team where you would prescribe things for patients and they would get them with no cost. Um, whereas now in Australia, it's predominantly private practice, and particularly our university is in a fairly low socioeconomic area. And there's a whole lot of different considerations now in terms of managing patients, um, which, which come into to kind of um, come into the way in, the, the, in which you make decisions. I think that um, you know, the evidence out there suggests that really um, we should be looking for clinical red flags 
And so this would be the typical thing. Let's look at our um, scenario of a patient with rheumatoid arthritis that um, would be classed as having optimal disease management from a DAS28 perspective, but has persistent medial ankle pain and has um, typical tenor synovitis. And if, they're, if they've got correctable rear foot deformity, and then you would try and correct that as, as much as possible. And, uh, and it, it depends what you might want to do is, is probably often combine that initiation of the mechanical based therapy with some targeted, um, you know, kind of a corticosteroid injection into the um, uh, tendon sheath under ultrasound guidance. That, that would be often a, a clear thing that, that I would kind of um, be looking to do. Um, I think that what you, I think one of the key things would be looking at um, the, the nature of the deformity and the impairments. And I think you can often consider rear foot, mid foot and forefoot. And um, different patients will have different spectrum of, of pathology. Um, you might have some patients with predominantly rear foot and their forefoot is fine. Um, you might have rear foot and forefoot, or you might have rear foot, midfoot and forefoot, or just midfoot. And I think it, it depends. I think you've got to be really clear as to what your functional goal would be from an orthotic perspective. I think you've also got to consider key areas like um, probably the soft tissues and their tolerance to be loaded in those key areas. Um, and um, very often what I would tend to do and there isn't evidence to, to really support this, is, is that you probably need to get patients used to um, tolerating um, an orthotic in an area where they wouldn't otherwise feel lured. And I think very often what you tend to find is when you've got patients with active inflammation, if you try and go in too controlling, when they still have active inflammation, they simply don't tolerate it. And then it really doesn't matter. I'll often see patients after they've had a bad experience with orthotics and you're then very up against it to try and get them to reconsider initiating that type of therapy again. Mm. I think the one thing that I would say is where I'm increasingly spending more of my time is with actually um, education and explanation of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Because very often patients in this group will feel that they need something soft and they have sore joints and they want them cushioned. Then you're there saying, well, actually, I want to give you this really rigid device. And, um, and the patients are like, oh, that's completely the worst thing that you could possibly suggest for me. Whereas I think if you take the time to explain them, and I think that that's one of the great things around ultrasound, um, you know, you can incorporate that as a really important educational tool. And I think that once patients can see and get what the problems are and what you're hoping to achieve, and I think also working with them and saying this is a journey that we'll be going on um, because often there's so many biomechanical problems and it's working out which one do I tackle, which one can I leave um, and what order would do we tackle um, them. So I think, um, you know, yes, you can say there's fairly good evidence for um, a rigid, customised orthotic in early disease in RA, but I think in reality, the, the expression of disease is so individual that increasingly I'm, I'm leaning more towards that really personal individual approach um, with patients as opposed to kind of, yeah, evidence suggests this, so this is what we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah makes sense. it's great to hear. Makes it, yeah. <laughs> Any anything else we need to go you know, through on the comments, Craig? I've got uh, no, not nothing to, to to question on. But I've got a question about what's always been an interest of mine, and that's the the heel pain and the spondyloarthropathies, and that you know we always should consider that in a differential. Mm. But my clinical experience in managing, or my my very limited clinical experience in managing heel pain and spondyloarthropathy is about a hundred percent failure. Mm. Uh, yet when I <laughs> read some of the uh, especially the podiatry textbooks on heel pain and spondylarthropathy. They always, they talk about low die strapping. They talk about foot orthoses and um, it, 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 either I'm doing something very wrong or it's not meant to work when the heel pain is due to the, uh, the, the seronegative. So I wonder if you comment my, my understanding is that the only thing that's going to work in those are going to be the biologics or, or the, the DMARDs. Um, so I wonder if you comment on that. I mean, um, certainly um, uh, we have had, um, you know, uh, 
we, we've had some good results, but we've also had um, some results where patients really don't get any better. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not in a position to say, and these were the ones that got better and these were the ones that didn't. Um, I think very often what we will tend to do is, is, is have a look around the foot to see if there is evidence of increased disease activity. And I think that you really do need to, to work on the basis that really we do need optimized, um, you know, kind of pharmacological management. Very often the, the kind of um, scenario is, is that they have, with the exception of this resistant um, kind of uh, thickened plantar fascia, very often, um, the approach that we've used is that we have um, targeted um, the site of maximum pathology and ultrasound, which I've got to say very often doesn't correspond with where the patient feels their symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and um, very often what we would look to do is to then post injection, put them into a below knee walking cast for a short period of time. Okay. Then, um, after that short period of time, work really closely um, with the physiotherapy team in terms of graduated activity, very often using um, hydrotherapy as that initial kind of rehab back in. Um, it is increasingly difficult. I think that if you were to try that targeted approach, and then obviously kind of with optimizing um, mechanical based therapy, I think if you've got calcification in the plantar fascia, generally my clinical experience is, is that that often is associated with not as good a response. If they have erosions that have developed on the um, plantar surface of the calcaneus again, that probably um, leans more towards that you're not going to get a favourable outcome. And I think at that point, um, would I be suggesting that we MR everyone with gadolinium and see if there's bone marrow edema? Um, I think that I wouldn't advocate that you'd need to do that for everyone, but certainly if you're then in the situation where you haven't had a response um, to that combined mechanical and a targeted injection, then very often, yeah, an MRI. And we have had some cases um, where the rheumatologist team, on the basis of significant bone marrow edema um, at the plantar fascial in insertion, have changed pharmacological management with a view to um, a biologic. Yeah. No, that, that's probably why I've got 100% failure in trying to manage it. <laughs> it's, it's I think, you know, the, the, the one thing that I would say is I think that people are really starting to get the message around um, gradual um, rehabilitation and loading of tendons. Oh, yeah. I think what we've got to remember is these patients are so disabled that if you were to actually have a look at their activity profiles – if you have managed to get them being able to stand and wash up and go to the toilet a couple of times and walk down to the shops, you've probably increased their activity by 150%. Mm -hmm. um, and that then you're probably at that point where then you're actually um, possibly, you know, we really do need to be getting a better understanding of, of how we introduce activity back in. And I think that that's probably one of the key issues. You get a good response from a localised um, kind of, uh, uh, steroid injection, but then actually the patients try and rush because they're so des desperate to get back to normal. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So I've got no... Have you got any more questions there, Ian? Sorry. No, there was just... Well, no. there's just one, actually. Uh, just one, which... Uh, it might be easy to answer, it might not. It's, it's, the question is, and we've asked this of, of other specialists of their specialism as well, is there one, one golden paper, one key paper? If someone says to you, what's your favourite paper? What's the best paper to read? Uh, if someone just wants to go, right, I want to go somewhere. I've, this episode's given me a bit of a, a thirst for more rheumatology sort of um, understanding or knowledge. What's the sort of paper top of your list that you would say to someone, yep, yeah, start here? Um, I probably wouldn't say a paper as such. Um, what I um, would um, suggest is um, the um, resources that you can find um, on, and it's not Arthritis Research UK anymore, is it? It's um, Arthritis versus Arthritis. I, they've just had a big rebranding, I understand. What you'll find is that. they've got some great information for health professions, and they have peer-reviewed topics um, that are clinical facing. I often find that the information that they put together 
patients is a great first start um, because uh, it, it's put in a really, um, you know, kind of simple language that then will allow, because I think that the one thing around rheumatology, um, because you've got over 300 different types um, of arthritis, um, is that um, I think you've got to recognise that you're always going to need to be reading. Um, and in fact, just on clinic yesterday, um, we had a, a patient who had come um, who had um, uh, kind of a plantar fascia and Achilles tendon problem. Um, she had gout, but she also had um, uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. And I was like, oh, all righty. Just <laughs> <laughs> And then I, you know, had to just go and have a, a quick read about it. And, um, you know, uh, the key thing was, um, was that, yeah, actually that had significant implications for us as podiatrists. Um, you know, they're at much increased risk of an aortic di dissection. They can get stenosis at an early stage in small vessels in the lower lane. Had no idea. Um, you know, and, um, and, um, you know, she, uh, that she also had renal problems, um, which then had, had kind of pushed and we could see visible reflectors, um, a, a double contour sign on her, um, on her cartilage of the first MTP joint. So I think it's about always reading. Um, and I think that there's, there's no other area, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, in, you know, my PhD was in diabetes. It wasn't in rheumatology. Um, and I think for me, there is no other area where I think it's just fantastic. The patients are great to work with. The rheumatologists are very pro podiatry and very supportive. And I think that there's, you know, there, there's always new things that you can be learning. Uh, yeah, actually, just, just one, one last question, Debbie, and we, we asked this of Steve Sabotnik last week in the context of sports medicine. Um, you got a new grad, they're interested in this, what advice would you give them? Okay, um, network and special interest groups. Okay. Mm. Perfect. And Perfect. also, you know, it's, um, I think there is nothing that facilitates you learning more than actually working with patients. Mm. Um, and I think that, that that's probably the, the key thing, get a network around you, always, um, always be um, willing to ask for help and an opinion. Um, and, um, and yeah, and actually just um, start building up that, that kind of that network of support. Um, and I think that working within rheumatology, it's probably one of the most supportive um, learning environments where you really do have that true blending of um, professional, um, you know, roles. Um, you know, the patients at the centre and everyone just wants to get the best outcomes possible because a lot of these patients will get their diagnosis in their 20s and 30s. Mm. Right. Well, I think that's a really good note to finish on. So thanks so much, Debbie. It's been the hours. Thanks, Debbie. Quickly. Thank you so much. Very okay. valuable.